In this video, I'm going to derive charge conservation from Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations are a very concise description of all of classical electromagnetism. All you need is those four equations that Maxwell outlined, plus Lorentz's force law, which tells you how charges respond to electric and magnetic fields. What we're going to do is we're going to take two of Maxwell's equations, that's Ampere's law, Ampere's circuital law, with Maxwell's modification, with this displacement current term, and we're going to take Gauss's law for electric fields. We're going to combine them together and use this vector identity, and that's actually going to help us derive charge conservation. And then after we have a look at that charge conservation derivation, what we're going to look at is the relationship of electromagnetism to fluids, because charge can sometimes behave like a fluid flowing. So we'll get to that intuitive explanation after we do the derivation. So let's go ahead and do this derivation. First of all, let's have a look at Ampere's circuital law. We've got it stated over here. We've got the curl of the magnetic field, and the curl of the magnetic field is on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have two terms. We have this term that is related to the current density, and we have this term which is related to the partial derivative with respect to time of the electric field. So this is telling us that if there's a change in the electric field, or if there's some kind of current flowing, that's going to induce a circulation of a magnetic field. So there's going to be some curl if any of these two conditions are satisfied. What is this, uh, one, this, this guy over here, what is this guy actually saying? This guy is Gauss's law. This is usually the first law that's written down in Maxwell's equations. It is uh, a understanding of the divergence of the electric field. So if there's an electric field coming out of a point, then there has to be some kind of charge density. And rho is the charge density. So rho is how dense uh, the, the charges are packed. Rho could be zero, and that means there's no charges at all. The divergence tells you how the electric field comes out of any point in space. And keep in mind, we're just looking at the differential form of these equations. We're not looking at the integral form of these equations. The integral form is useful when you're actually trying to calculate when you have some kind of distribution of charge, or if you have currents flowing in and there's some kind of distribution that would tell you the j's and the e's, then we would actually use the integral form. But because we're doing a purely theoretical manipulation of Maxwell's equations to derive charge conservation, we just need the differential form. And that's why we have our handy del operator. So del op the del operator is this upside down triangle. Sometimes this is called nabla, and it's an upside down Greek letter delta, right? It's an upside down triangle. When we take the dot product, we call that the divergence, and when we take the cross product, then we call that the curl. So this is the curl. This is a vector quantity that tells you how things are rotating in 3D space, and this is a vector quantity, the divergence, that tells you how things are coming out in 3D space. So let's go ahead and use this nifty little vector identity that says the divergence of the curl of any vector field is always going to be zero. Let's use that. So how are we going to use that? Well, what we can do is we can take the divergence of both sides of this equation. So let's do that. So we'll take the divergence of the left-hand side. That's going to give me divergence of the curl of the magnetic field. And that's going to be equal to this over here. We're going to take the divergence of all of this. So divergence of all of this stuff. Mu naught j, that's the current density, plus mu naught epsilon naught, and then we're going to have the partial derivative of the electric field with respect to time. So we're taking the divergence of this side, and we're taking the divergence of that side. So you can see that that's the same. So now we're going to use the property of linearity, and we're going to distribute this divergence operator inside. And when we do that distribution, we can actually take these constants out the front. And we can even swap the order of differentiation and this divergence operator. So we can put the divergence operator directly onto the electric field in here. And what's going to happen on the left-hand side? Well, we know from this identity, the divergence of the curl is 0. So this left-hand side is going to disappear. So this is going to be equal to 0, and this 
is going to be distributed. So let's let's have uh, let's rewrite this expression. So we're going to have zero is equal to mu naught. I'm going to take that constant out the front. And then I'm going to have the divergence of j, which is the current density vector, plus got mu naught, epsilon naught, these two constants. And then we're going to take the divergence inside the partial derivative. And so we'll have the partial derivative of the divergence of the electric field. So what have we done? We've taken this operator, we've taken the constant out here, and we're acting on this j with the operator. And then we've moved this operator inside here when we've distributed, and it's acting directly on the electric field. Now there's still a partial derivative here, and that partial derivative is going to be applied later. But why have I swapped the order of the time derivative and the divergence? What use does this form have? Well, we can apply Gauss's law. Gauss's law says the divergence of the electric field is the charge density over epsilon naught, which is the permeativity of free space. So this is just a constant, and this is the charge density, which is a scalar quantity. So the divergence of a vector quantity, that's going to give us a scalar, right? Because you're adding up the partial derivative of all of the, the vectors, uh, all, of the, all the components of the vector, and that's going to give you a scalar overall. So this is a scalar, even though these, these guys are both vectors. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, we've got all of this equal to 0. So I'm going to factor out this mu naught, because we don't need mu naught, right? Because uh, if, even if we multiply all of this by 100, it's still going to be equal to 0, right? Because we know all of that's equal to 0. So I'm going to cancel out this mu naught, divide everything by mu naught, and that's going to give us 0 equals the divergence of j plus epsilon naught times, now we're, well, we've gotten rid of this constant and we still have this partial derivative. But what am I going to put instead of this divergence? Well, I'm going to substitute uh, this right-hand side of Gauss's law. So I'm going to put that in here. So we have rho, this is the charge density, over the constant epsilon naught. Right, so we have rho over epsilon naught. So I want you to be comfortable with that. We're taking this divergence, and we're just setting it equal to this. And now we, we can just differentiate the, the term inside here. And what can we do now? Well, you can actually see there's an epsilon naught in the front, and there's an epsilon naught inside over here. And here we're dividing. Uh, differentiation is a linear operator. So what we can do is we can take the constant out the front, and it's going to cancel with this constant. So this guy is going to cancel with that guy. So what do we have in the end? We have, I'll write this... Uh, very, very big and clear at the bottom, the partial derivative of the charge density with respect to time, that's what we get from this term over here, because the epsilon naught's cancel, plus the divergence of j, which is the current density, the electric current density vector, that's all going to be equal to zero. I'll put a big box around this. Does this look familiar to you? If you've studied fluid mechanics, this looks just like the continuity equation. And the continuity equation says that you can't actually destroy any fluid. Any fluid that's flowing into a region has to either flow out of the region or nothing's going to work, right? You can't just have fluid uh, being created out of nowhere, right? This is where mass conservation comes into play. So with fluid mechanics, this is analogous to mass conservation. But because we're doing electromagnetism over here, this is analogous to charge conservation. So there's a lot of analogies that can be drawn between different field theories. With any time you're, you're looking at masses, and when you're adding up masses, what you're going to have is density, right? Mass per unit volume. And if you integrate the density with respect to volume, what you're going to get is the total mass. In the same way, if you have charge per unit volume, which is this row, this is charge density, and if you integrate charge density over volume, what's that going to give you? Well, that's going to give you the total charge. Integrating the total, uh, in integrating all of the charge density over an entire volume, that gives you the total charge. And so this is analogous, right? These are analogous quantities. Mass and charge have similar roles in these equations. So this looks very similar to the continuity equation. 
in, in the continuity equation for fluid mechanics, the change in the density of a region in space is dictated by how much fluid is flowing into that region and how much fluid is flowing out. So if, if the density goes up, that means there's more fluid going in than is coming out. And if the density is going down, what does that mean? More fluid is coming out than is going in. So the net flow would be negative if the density goes down, and the net flow would be positive into the surface if the density is going up. So I want you to think about that uh, intuitively. So continuity in fluid mechanics is actually very closely linked to charge conservation in electromagnetism. Now, the next little thing I want to cover is what does this J mean and what does this rho mean? Well, J is the current density, right? It's the electric current density. So we can actually write J uh, in, in terms of a surface integral, and that's going to equal the current. So the current I, which is in amps, is going to be the same as a surface integral over some surface S of J dotted with dS. Right? This is a surface integral of the current density, which is the electric current density vector. And we're taking the dot product as it goes over, through some surface, and we're going to take the surface integral, and that's going to give us the current. Right? That's the current going through some kind of surface that sits in three dimensions. What about rho? Well, rho, if you were to integrate it, is going to give you the charge, the total charge. In the same way that if you integrated the mass density over some volume, you would get the total mass. So the total charge Q is going to be equal to the volume integral. I'm writing three integrals because it's a triple integral, three dimensions, it's a volume of rho dV. And this rho is the charge density. So the units of this guy are coulombs per meter cube, or charge per unit volume, right? Coulombs per meter cube. And this guy is just coulombs, because integrating three times, doing a triple integral, that gets rid of all of those units of length. So those meters cancel out. In the same way, this guy is in the units of amps, right? Amps, that's the unit of current, the SI unit. And over here, you have amps per meter squared, right? That's the SI unit for electric current density. Or it's current per unit area. This is current per unit area. This is charge per unit volume. And that's what these guys, rho and j, actually represent. So if you were to put these guys into an integral, you could actually make this into an integral expression as well. But I'm going to keep it in this differential expression because that's easier for us to think of. What I want to do is I want to think of a point in space, a tiny little point. right? So let's think of a tiny little point and a tiny little bubble around that point. So I'm going to draw a tiny little bubble around that point. So we have a tiny little bubble. And imagine, as we talked about before, there is a charge flowing inside, right? So there's charge flowing inside, and that creates a current. So there's little currents going in, and there's little currents going out. Now, if these currents flow in more than they flow out, as we said before, that's going to increase the density. So the density is going to go up. So there's going to be more charge inside. But if there's more of these, these little packets of current, these electrons or whatever kind of charge carriers they are, if there's more current flowing out than there is flowing in, there's going to be a net drop, right? Because the flux is going to be a net positive outwards and a net negative inwards. So that means that this density will drop. So try and picture that. Try and picture a tiny, tiny little bubble with some charge inside. And there's constantly things flowing into the bubble and things flowing out of the bubble. You can generalize this bubble uh, by sticking many, many, many bubbles together. And take the limit as those bubbles tend to be infinitely small, infinitesimal little bubbles. And that's actually what integral calculus does. And that would, that would be the integral equivalent of this expression, which is the differential form. So I'll give a quick summary of what we covered in this video. In this video, we started from Ampere's circuital law and Gauss's law. These are Maxwell's equations. These are two of Maxwell's equations. We combine them together, and we use this vector identity. This vector identity states that the divergence of the curl of any vector field, here it's A, A is just a many vector field, that is equal to zero. So divergence of the curl of a vector field, that is equal to zero. And then we took the divergence of Ampere's circuit law. Using that vector identity, 
we could just set one, one side of this equation equal to zero, and then we distributed the divergence operator inside, and we acted on it on the electric field, and then we used Gauss's law, substituted that inside, and it gave us this equation over here, which tells us that charge is invariant. The amount of charge in a closed system is invariant. It's going to be constant. So this is charge conservation. And charge conservation is analogous to the conservation of mass in fluid mechanics. 